if you think about a, co a collectivized farmer, there might be 300 other farms on your collective farm. If you work harder, get up earlier, stay up later, maintain your tractor, maintain your equipment, and, and manage to increase your output, you have to share that with 299 other farmers. And so there's very little incentive for you to do this. In a socialist society, almost nobody has an incentive to create value for others. Socialism podcast, where we try to understand more about what life was really like in socialist societies and how these societies started down the path towards socialism in the first place. In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Matthew Mitchell. Matthew Mitchell is a senior fellow in the Center for Economic Freedom. And prior to joining the Fraser Institute, he was a long ser serving senior fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, where he remains an affiliated scholar today. He's also a senior research affiliate at the Knee Center for the Study of Occupational Regulation at West Virginia University. He's the author of many books and articles, including The Road to Socialism and Back Again, An Economic History of Poland, which he co-wrote along with Peter Betke and Konstantin Zukov. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today and taking the time to share your expertise with us and taking us on this learning, learning journey down Poland's road to socialism. Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Well, I want to start our discussion by asking you to explain or define what you mean by socialism. I think there's a lot of confusion in, you know, non-economist circles that what does socialism actually mean? Uh, what people use it in conversation to mean isn't necessarily what I think you're talking about in this book. Yeah, that, that's fair, especially because in the last 20 or 30 years, I think the word has uh, sort of changed meaning uh, for a lot of people. So the original definition of socialism, you know, comes from the socialists themselves. Uh, we're talking about people like Karl Marx and, and uh, Frederick Engels. Uh, and for them, socialism was really two important things. Uh, as Marx and Engels put it, it can be summed up as uh, in one sentence, which is the abolition of private property. Um, and if private prop if there's no private property, what does that mean? Well, uh, the other definition is that it is uh, the means of, of owner the uh, means of production are controlled by the state. So if you don't have individual private property and individual economic freedom, then what you have is we as a group, as a society, uh, ideally uh, through the democratic process is, is the way socialists uh, described it, would determine, they, we, we would own the means of production and determine uh, how dis economic decisions are made. So instead of uh, individual entrepreneurs and consumers, uh, uh, private folks having the means of production and, and controlling their economic lives, uh, we all make these decisions collectively through the group. So that's sort of the ideal of socialism and the original meaning of it. Um, I think today it's fair to say a lot of people just, when they say the word socialism, they sort of are vaguely referring to uh, larger government, uh, maybe more redistribu redistribution or, or social safety net. Um, you know, sometimes they talk about countries like um, Denmark and Sweden. Uh, ironically, Denmark and Sweden are among the most capitalist countries in the world. Uh, they have pretty high levels of economic freedom. They do have large governments, however, and they do have a relatively large uh, redistributive state. Um, but they are not, you know, the original uh, you know, version of socialism that Marx and Engels were talking about. Yeah, so under the original conception of socialism, these questions, these important economic questions that uh, typically we leave markets to answer these questions, like what to produce, how to produce it, how much to produce, where does it go? Um, those questions are then being answered by kind of central planners and factories, businesses, the state is taking control of everything. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, in theory, uh, socialism doesn't have to be a uh, dictatorship. 
Uh, in reality, uh, socialism uh, was almost always implemented by dictators. Uh, you know, the biggest, uh, most notorious example, of course, would be Stalin, but, uh, you know, also Mao and Pol Pot and others. But uh, so the basic yeah, idea is that what a factory makes, what it produces is going to be determined by the central plan and the central plan will be, uh, you know, created and run by the government. Now, this doesn't mean that, you know, an individual factory owner can't kind of game the system a little bit. And in fact, that's part of the problem um, of how socialist systems worked is that, you know, individual factory owners found that they could actually profit, you know, gain some, uh, some um, you know, personal economic gain by manipulating the system. One way they did that was by purposely throttling production. Um, and the reason they did this is by throttling production and limiting the amount of cons particularly consumer resources, they could then sell those products uh, on the black market. Um, and ironically, uh, the system might not have even worked. It might not have even, you know, survived for as long as it did were it not for this sort of corruption because the corruption allowed the central planners to get the the factory managers to do their jobs. It was one way to actually incentivize them to, to get some stuff done was to kind of look the other way during uh, when they engaged in what the Russians called blot, which is, you know, basically corruption. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to, to talk about some of the challenges that central planners face as they're trying to direct this massive, complicated thing that is an economy. Um, in the book, you talk about three problems, uh, control problems, knowledge problems, and incentive problems. So I think it might be useful for, for listeners to, to have a little bit of an explanation about what each of those problems means and and how might it manifest in in a socialist system yeah now uh one thing before we dive into this to think through is you know we have a tendency i think as humans when we see something go wrong to assume it was just bad people and we don't think through i think the way an economist would think about it is uh yeah it could be bad people but it could also be bad systems. And that's one of the things I'd like to emphasize here is that these three problems, the control problem, the knowledge problem, and the incentive problem are going to plague any attempt to centrally direct an economy, whether you have you know, uh, uh, completely knowledgeable angels in uh, control or whether you have actual you know, homo sapiens in control who are fallible. Uh, these, these problems are, are gonna, gonna persist. So the control problem, this is the idea that, that if you want to centrally plan an economy, you have to exercise an extraordinary amount of control over human behavior. Um, so Adam Smith, uh, the, the famous economist, actually talked about this in 1776, and he said, you know, uh, the man of system who thinks that he can rearrange society is acting as if he can uh, move people like they are pieces of a chessboard. Um, and that's exactly, you know, what ended up happening in uh, socialist societies. You, you see them exercise an extraordinary degree of control over people, um, determining what they uh, can, how they can work, limiting their ability to start their own businesses, of course, uh, the, the terms under which they are allowed to work, what they can buy. Um, and then, interestingly yeah. enough and sadly enough, it crept into other aspects of their lives. Um, so where they lived, um, even uh, what they read. Uh, what they listened to, uh, it created essentially a totalitarian state. Um, you know, the words of Mussolini, a totalitarian state is that which uh, everything is within the state, um, nothing is against the state, and nothing is outside the state. That's essentially what, what they ended up um, uh, creating in the pursuit of control. Uh, so that's the control problem. Um, the knowledge problem suggests that, uh, okay, if you know, if the control problem requires the state to rearrange pieces of a chessboard, um, the knowledge problem means that it, the state will not know exactly where to put the pieces. And the reason is it's not because they're dumb or they're or they're uh, uh, even evil. It's that they they are flying blind because they don't have the signals of prices, profit, and loss. So in a market economy, um, you have the knowledge. Uh, entrepreneurs gain the knowledge of how to create value for other people because consumers are constantly giving them feedback through the price uh, mechanism. 
And so if, a, if, if it's better to channel more resources into one line of production versus another, the market signal will, will generate that knowledge. Now, it was possible for the state, uh, for socialist states to have pretty, you know, incredible technological feats. Uh, you know, we can't forget that the Soviets were the first people to put a man into space. Um, they could, uh, yet, uh, the, these technological feats aren't actually necessarily allowing the, the the central planners to produce things that people wanted. So you have, you know, again, another sort of notorious example was the building of the White Sea Canal, which was this essentially planned uh, little sort of pet project of Stalin um, in which they built this uh, very long canal, often with extremely limited technology, using literally uh, working people with hands and uh um, and shovels, um, about 25,000 people died in the building of this canal. And when it was done, it was basically not usable because it was only a few feet deep in some areas. So you can get people to produce, but it's not necessarily stuff that people want. So um, there's a, um, a journalist who, uh, her, her name, uh, I'm not going to try to uh, pronounce her name because I'll probably mispronounce it, but she's a Croatian journal journalist. And she pointed out that, uh, you know, Probably one of the best examples of the state of communism failing is that in 70 years of its existence, it did not produce any uh, tampaxes or uh, uh, you know products that are half the population needs. Right. So you can create have these great technological wonders, but because of the knowledge problem, you won't actually create things that people want. Okay, so that's that's a uh, control problem and knowledge problem. The final problem, which maybe uh, people will find uh, pretty intuitive. Um, is just the incentive problem. And that is that in a socialist society, almost nobody has an incentive to create value for others. Um, you, you don't, there's no profit motive. Um, you know, if you think about a, a collectivized farmer, uh, for example, you know, there, there might be 300 other farms on your collective farm. If you work harder, uh, get up earlier, stay up later, maintain your tractor, maintain your, your uh, equipment and, and manage to produce uh, you know, increase your output, you have to share that with 299 other farmers. And so there's very little incentive for you to do this. Uh, similarly, you, you know, you can't challenge uh, another business. There was the, the socialist planners believe that one of the great virtues of socialism is that there was little competition, but uh, it was all just one plan. Uh, well, that means if you see somebody doing a, uh, offering a bad service, you can't profit by changing it. Uh, and then I've already mentioned, you know, ironically, or, and unfortunately, um, managers actually could profit by destroying value, by withholding uh, goods and services from the market and then selling them on the black market. So those three problems um, all work together, the control problem, the incentive problem, and the knowledge problem to really sort of doom socialism's main aim, which was to create abundance and equality. And so in, in the book, you talk about how these three challenges together um, give rise to something you call the pathologies of privilege. What do you mean by that? And and why can this be a problem, not just, maybe not even just under the centrally planned state, but even in a post-transition context, it could maybe continue to be problematic? Yeah, absolutely. So, um yeah, remember, uh, if you kind of keep in mind the two, uh, you know, laudable goals of, of socialism are uh, material abundance and um, social and material equality. Those are sort of the two main goals. And uh, in many ways, it, it aimed for both and it got neither. Um, and the reason it, it, it uh, let, let's focus a little bit on the equality point. Um, the reason, uh, there, there's several reasons for this. So one is when you've got this centrally planned organization, of course, as anybody who has spent any time on a committee or in, in any organization knows, uh, humans bureaucratize. That's what we do, right? Uh, and so bureaucracies do form. Um, it, part of that is just as a way to kind of, uh, you know, manage uh, the flow of information. Um, so you don't, no, nobody wants to have 100 direct reports. So instead you have 10 and each of them have uh, 10 direct reports, right? And so that uh, tends to create a bureaucracy. Um, but in a, in a free enterprise system, large hulking bureaucratic firms get challenged all the time by new ones. And that sort of churn is a, is a very helpful, um, you know, sort of 
antidote to the, the bureaucratizing nature of any organization. Um, but so you've got that natural bureaucracy. Then you have the fact that, you know, once you start, again, through the control problem, once you start exercising control one person over another, that's very tempting, unfortunately, for a lot of people. It tends to attract the worst kinds of elements. Um, I don't think it's a very big surprise that most uh, socialist states have been led by, at one time or another by ruthless dictators. Uh, and you can see, you know, um, there's differences. Stalin was far more ruthless than Khrushchev under almost any uh, any measure. But Khrushchev was still pretty ruthless, right? Um, and so uh, you, you attract these people who then can use their power. Uh, then they're able to, to, you have the problem because of the incentive problem, you can't incentivize managers to produce for the, the public. And so then um, you have this, this issue, which I was, I was discussing earlier, where essentially the state looks the other way when managers, um, you know, appropriate goods themselves in order to, to sell them on the black market. Uh, the other way, some of this, the, the state explicitly looked the other way was part of their policy. Um, they began giving, you know, favors and privileges to those who were in the top of the uh, system that they were known as the nomenclatura. So if you were lucky enough to be a top manager that we're talking about, you know, less than one half of 1% of the Polish society, for example, um, you lived a very different life than average polls. So while the average poll uh, on a typical day was not able to find um, meat in the grocery store, uh, let alone uh, coffee and sugar and uh, um, transportation and uh, uh, anything made out of rubber, uh, all of these things were just subject to rampant shortages. If you were a, a member of the elite, the nomenclatura, you did have access to that. And the, the reason you had access to it is that there were special shops specifically designed just for them where they could shop and find goods uh, that were unavailable to others. Uh, often they were they were uh, Western made goods, right? Uh, the elite also had their own uh, special resorts where they could, uh, the spas that uh, the rest of the public had no access to, hunting grounds that the rest of the public had no access to. They were typically alar uh, allowed larger living spaces. Um, they were often had their own, you know, resort dashas, uh, uh, vacation homes. Um, they had access to their own health care that the rest of the public didn't have and their own pension plans that the rest of the public didn't have. And they uh, could avoid paying taxes. They weren't allowed or they, they, they weren't required to pay taxes the way everybody else had to. Uh, this is a, a fact that was made um, uh, kept a state secret because it, it was so sensitive. Uh, so, you know, not only did socialism produce, fail to produce um, material uh, abundance, it also was a very inequitable society. And so that's why we call it the pathology of privilege. It created a privileged class and an, and an underclass. Um, and that really is very uh, pathologizing in terms of the way a society works. Yeah, and it's so uh, maybe you know, ironic in a way that Marx, one of the reasons he thought socialism and then communism would be an ideal system is that it would get rid of these social divides and these distinct social classes. It would be more, you know, we would be comrades, we would be more equal with one another. Um, and again, as you said, um, critics of capitalism were calling it a wasteful process, this duplication and the advertising and all of these other aspects of, of competition that require resources, you know, under under socialism, we were supposed to avoid the wastefulness of, of that competitive process. But in exchange, we have a system of incentives that doesn't quite inspire, you know, human nature to be, you know, productive. Um, but on top of that, mm -hmm. you talk a lot about the environment and how natural resources natural resources are also being exploited um so i would love to hear a little bit more about that that's not, not something that you you often hear about um under you know past examples of, of socialism you don't hear too much discussion of what was actually going on with the environment yeah, that's right. And, you know, some of this is, I think, uh, part of a product of just, you know, our our uh, y our young society. So, I mean, you and I are uh, probably still too young to necessarily remember watching the news of the Berlin Wall fall. 
But when that happened, um, environmentalists from the West now finally had access to see what was going on in, behind the Iron Curtain, and they were appalled. So, I mean, if you're if we were having this conversation even just 20 years ago, I think it would I think we all of us would be a little bit more aware of this. But the the um, the actual socialist record on the environment was atrocious. And you can you can understand why. Again, think of those signals of prices, profit and loss. Um, so, you know, in a pro, uh, you know, in a market economy, you are incentivized to economize on the resource use. Right. You know, you, you your your profits are higher if you manage to do more with less. Ironically, in a socialist economy, often the you the managers were rewarded since they had no signal of prices and profits and loss, their reward signal was literally weight, which is ridiculous, but it's weight counts. A manager would get his his or her bonus uh, if he managed to produce a higher tonnage of output. So that built into the system was uh, uh, exploitation of, of resources. And, uh, you know, Marx has a, a beautiful way with words. He talked about how uh, capital is all, all capitalist progress was the result of robbing the laborer and robbing the soil. I would argue that's really the case. Uh, actual socialism robbed the labor and robbed the soil. And you can see it in the data, you know, so uh, the, the number of kilograms of steel consumed to make a thousand dollars of output um, in a or in Poland, it was 135 kilograms, uh, whereas in the UK, it was 38. Right. Um, if you look at uh, sulfur oxides per, uh, per person, um, in socialist economies, you know, it's 116 in Poland, it's 300 in East Germany, uh, whereas in the U.S. it was 90. Uh, in France, it was uh, 31. The U.K. was 65. So uh, when you, are, you, you aren't guided by prices, profit, and loss, you tend to make uh, bad choices. And then, you know, there's, there's also uh, the legacy of the poor legal system. So the state, you know, controlled... This is again part of this idea of exercising control. They control the legal system, so it's not like you could sue, uh, you know, a state firm for uh, it dumping um, ash heap uh, through throughout eastern Estonia, which is what happened. Is they just uh, totally despoiled uh, really about about a third of the water systems in uh, uh, in Estonia uh, by just uh, doing this. The phosphate, which, by the way, would never have been, it's phosphate mining that would have never passed a um, cost-benefit analysis. If, if they were guided by the profit motive, they would have never even tried to uh, use Estonian phosphate because it wasn't very good, high quality phosphate. Um, but in, in any case, you know, they, they took it out of the ground and they just threw it uh, and despoiled uh, literally, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres. Um, and you could, it's not like you could sue the state over that because there was no functioning system of private property rights or legal system that allowed you to challenge the state. So what about the workers, right? Um, you know, one of the reasons why Marx criticized capitalism is that workers are being exploited. Was it at least the lives of the workers were that, was that any better under the socialist system than it was under capitalism? Uh, no, and I wish I could say it was, but unfortunately it wasn't. Um, and it, I, I suppose the one thing you could say is that there was uh, not a lot of non-work. There wasn't a lot of people of unemployment. Uh, but the reason there was not a lot of unemployment is because it was illegal to be unemployed. Uh, so you know, you, you may want to look up uh, Article 12 of the Soviet Constitution: uh, "He who does not work, neither shall he eat." Um, what, you know, they found out pretty quickly that people are, you know, typically not necessarily motivated uh, by ideology. A lot of people are motivated to uh, create uh, value for themselves and for their loved ones, right? And so in order to motivate people, they had to, again, exercise a lot of control over them. So, for example, in the first uh, seven months of 1950, uh, 42,433 Poles were arrested uh, for the crime of non-work. Um, they would be sent to forced labor camps. Um, uh, some of them, of course, would be uh, political prisoners. Um, what's interesting is, and we'll get to this, I, I, I suppose, in our second discussion, is it, Poland, the, 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 you know, the final uh, stage of socialism was supposed to be that the state withers away in capital or in, uh, uh, you just have pure communism. In reality, of course, late socialism led to uh, a... Uh, throwing over the system and you you have capitalism but what really uh 
tipped the you know tipped the balance was worker revolts. Uh, so it was the very in uh, Poland they organized the, the very first um, independent trade union, which was the first trade union to not be organized by the political state. So so again, if you go back to some of Marx's claims, you know the idea that um, particularly his claims against capitalism and sort of the um, caricatures he painted of capitalism, the idea that uh, ultimately intellectuals and workers would unite in revolt. Uh, this is one of the many, many claims of, of Marx that ended up being 100% true if you just ha substitute the word uh, so, uh, capitalism, to strike that out and in, in its place put socialism because what really happened in Poland is uh, intellectuals and workers united uh, to throw off the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really jumped out at me um, when reading your work is that the state called people that didn't work social parasites. What a you know kind of appalling and harsh way to speak about people. Um, and some of those people might legitimately be incapable of of supplying their labor. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's true. And so the, the state, again, as part of this control problem, um, you know, they had a lot of different means of trying to exercise control over people. Um, and one of them was um, the mythology around what were known as shock workers. So the most famous of these is this guy, uh, Alexei Stakhanov, who was a um, Russian um, coal miner who apparently, you know, moved titanic amounts of coal. And uh, they built this sort of cult around uh, Stakhanov. It was called the Stakhanovite uh, cult. Uh, if you grew up in a communist society and you, you know, attended the state schools and you went to the, you, you were a member of the Pioneers, which was their their version of uh, the uh, Boy Scouts. It was basically the way they indoctrinated youth. Uh, if you were a member of the Consumal, <laughs> which was, uh, you know, after the after the Boy Scouts. Um, you definitely knew about Stakhanov and the Stakhanovites, and you were pushed to produce as much as you can. Um, and there was, you know, when people would complain about that, um, in Poland, we have plenty of examples of this, uh, the state cracked down on them. Um, if if they felt like they were being pushed too much and they laid down their tools, the state uh, responded ruthlessly, uh, sometimes murderously. A lot more exploitative well, than having unequal income distribution. Uh, that's true. And, you know, well, uh, yeah, and, and the dollar uh, differences in their in their paid income was not great, but they still had inequality in, in other ways as well. Right. So I want to back up a little bit um, and, and just kind of get a little bit of history about you know, how did Poland embark on their great experiment, well, horrible, I wouldn't, big experiment, great in the sense of large, not good. Yeah. Um, but how did they embark on this experiment with socialism? Um, can you give us a little background on their history and, and how they ended yeah. up heading down this path? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, we, I do use the term experiment and I and I, I am uh, careful to use the term because I don't want to give it, give the impression uh, that the polls had any choice in the matter. Uh, so humans were experimented on, um, but it was at the point of a gun. Uh, and so uh, in some ways, the experiment goes all the way back to Lenin, who uh, in 1920, wanted to invade Poland as, as a way to tr start an international revolution. Um, and in what came to be known as the miracle of, on the Vistula, uh, the Poles fought back and repelled uh, the Red Army. Um, interestingly enough, Stalin was, act was actually personally embarrassed in this campaign um, and made some strategic errors. And many people believe that his personal embarrassment over this um, is part of the reason why he kind of uh, had personal en enmity towards the Poles later. Um, so the, the uh, they were repelled in, in 1920, in the miracle on the Vistula, uh, but in 1939, uh, the Soviets were more successful. So what happened in August, uh, August 23rd, 1939, is after decades of saying uh, that the, um, the fascists were, the, were capitalists, um, suddenly, the Soviet Union changed 
its tune and decide and decided to welcome um, uh, Herr von Ribbentrop, the German foreign minister, to Moscow. Uh, he landed in Moscow in August uh, 1939. He was greeted with six uh, large swastikas. Uh, the, that were concealed from the street so average Russians wouldn't see them. Uh, the swastikas, by the way, had been um, actually taken from a Soviet propaganda studio where they had recently been used in videos uh, denouncing the Nazis. Now they were used to welcome the Nazis. Uh, they uh, signed the uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Uh, afterwards, uh, Stalin, who was not a heavy drinker, uh, toasted uh, to the health of uh the fear of uh, Hitler. Uh, and in this pact, they publicly agree to uh, non-aggression, but they privately agree to, in what are, what are called the secret protocols of the pact, uh, they ended up being very poorly kept secrets because uh, news of them got out uh, almost immediately. Uh, though the Soviets denied the existence of these protocols for five decades, well into the Gorbachev era, um, but the secret protocols basically agreed to divvy up East uh, Europe between uh, Germany and the Soviet Union. So Germany was given um, reign over the western half of Poland, and the Soviet Union was given reign over the eastern half of Poland. The Soviets also got the Baltic states uh, and and other eastern eastern European um, countries. So uh, with the pact signed. The Nazis moved in uh, the very next month, at the beginning of September 1939, uh, invaded Poland from the west, and the Soviets, Soviet Red Army, invaded Poland from the east. They met. They had a joint parade in the Polish town of uh, uh, Brest. Uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it because I'll probably mispronounce it. <laughs> but they, uh, Brest, Brest Litovsk. Uh, they had a had a joint parade. Parade celebrated. Um, and that really initiated the beginning of, of the rule. Now, as your listeners will know, uh, two years later, the Germans turned on their erstwhile allies and invaded the Soviet Union. Um, and so at that point, then uh, the, the Germans took over, totally ravaged Poland. Poland uh, had been uh, a, a, a very large Jewish population. They were almost entirely annihilated uh, by the Germans. Uh, and then eventually the uh, Soviets reinvaded Poland in 1944. Now, um, once they reinvaded, the Germans or the, the Soviets pretty quickly claimed credit for liberal, uh, liberating Poland. And for years, uh, in fact, even just this year, uh, you know, the, the Russian foreign minister went to um, Poland to lay a wreath commemorating the day that they had uh, liberated Poland. Now, this year was interesting because the Poles, uh, a group of Polish citizens uh, were having none of it and said, no, they, they, they uh, kept him from laying the wreath and said, you don't get to clay, lay claim to liberating us when you invaded, uh, when you first, uh, you know, signed a, a secret pact with the Nazis and invaded us and divvied us up and then uh, ended up being double crossed by the Nazis. You don't get to get to uh, lay claim to that. So, you know, the, uh, the very long answer to your your short question is uh, the way the experiment began was at the point of a gun. Um, I mean, that, that was a big question. <laughs> 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 but I, I do kind of want to know there the, the onset of socialism had to be challenging, right? Because of the first stages of socialism, you have to get, you know, we're in a capitalist system. People do have private property. How do you go from that system where people own things to a system where everything's collectively owned? I mean, if somebody came and I had a successful business and said, you know, nice job, Rosie, we're going to, we're going to take over from here. I don't know that I would be really happy about that and really eager to let go. Um, so, so was that kind of a tumultuous time period in Poland? Yes, it absolutely was. And I should note, by the way, uh, there's actually two ways in which uh, Poland had it better than other s socialist states. Uh, they did not collectivize housing as they did elsewhere. So in uh, Estonia, which we are, we have a new book coming out about Estonia in a, in a couple months, uh, they actually collectivized uh, 
homes. You would have to give up part of your home, maybe most of your home, to several other families that were were uh, placed in there to for a collective housing. Um, and the second way that that uh, Poland had it better is they did not collectivize agriculture. I think it's the only uh, socialist state where they didn't attempt to collectivize ag agriculture. Um, and this is uh, was great for the Poles uh, in part because it meant that they avoided the just absolutely horrific um, socialist control of agriculture that led to uh, millions of, of deaths and famine. Um, so that those are two, you know, real bright spots. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, as you uh, suggest, in order to take over people's productive property, collectivizing um, businesses, absolutely the state had to exercise ruthless control. Um, so this, so 84,000, the 84,000 that were sent to forced labor camps between 1949 and 1954, a lot of these are people who, who you know, were small business owners or large business owners, um, factory workers who didn't want to give up their uh, personal productive property and oppose the state, and they paid for it uh, as a result of that. Uh, 49,000 political prisoners in 1952, again, these are people who opposed, um, you know, what was going on. Um, another way that they exercised control was through a vast network of secret police. So everywhere that the Red Army went in, they also brought in um, what were the N called the NKVD. They, they were the predecessors to the KGB. And so they would um, immediately begin began interrogating people, identifying those who were potentially, you know, threats to the state or opposed the state. You know, maybe they... Uh, had the temerity to want to keep their own property, um, and they would uh, arrest them. Uh, and as a part of the the system, they would also arrest their family members. So uh, in nineteen in nineteen thirty five, uh, the the Soviets had passed a, a statute that that allowed um, uh, family members to be arrested if they if um, somebody was an enemy of the state and it could actually go down to uh, 12 years old. So 12 year olds could be held prisoners um, because the, just simply for the crime of having a parent who was deemed an enemy of the state. Um, and so then as part of this, they also then, you know, created this vast network of informers, 26,000 uh, informers throughout Poland that would, uh, you know, regularly uh, report on neighbors, on family members, on uh, associates, and they had a strong incentive to do this in part because they wanted to uh, make sure that they didn't get caught up in the dragnet. Um, so, yeah, it's just a, a, a horrific human tragedy in terms of what people had to uh, sacrifice in order to, uh, you know, they were the eggs that had to be broken in order to make um, Stalin's omelet. Yeah, it, one of those less obvious effects of socialism that you guys mentioned in the book is this degradation of people's moral character. And you use the language that Jane Jacobs uses. Um, we create this monstrous moral hybrid. And so this, you know, as opposed to creating a nice, friendly community spirit where everybody's comrades, it seems like it's pitting neighbor against neighbor, family member against family member. And what a horrific way way to live. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So, you know, some of this comes about because of what I was just talking about, you know, the, if you're building a totalitarian state and you, you, uh, you know, create a network of informants uh, throughout the state. And some of this started very young, you know, children. Uh, it, I, met, I already mentioned the, uh, you know, the members of the, the pioneers. Um, one of the famous stories that the Soviets and then uh, the, the Polish communist leaders told and retold and retold. And every, every kid who grew up in a, in a socialist society knew this was the story of Pavlik Morozov. So this was a young boy, I think he was 12 years old, um, who ended up uh, denouncing his father uh, as, a, as a kulak, which was the, the Russian word for a, a rich peasant. Um, and the, the Russians, uh, basically, the, the Soviets had... Um, demonized anybody who didn't want to collectivize agriculture. And so this was a, 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 a Russian boy who was a member of the pioneers. He um, denounced his father. He was later murdered. Uh, we don't exactly know the circumstances under how he was murdered. I think the latest evidence suggests it was probably by other boys over a, a dispute over a gun. So it had nothing to do with politics. Um, but the murder was blamed on his family. And the Soviets turned him into a hero. 
Uh, here is this boy who is so committed to the cause that he's willing to turn his own father in uh, to the state. Um, and as a result, he lost his life. Uh, so that's kind of the mentality of what's going on in this society where you're where they're really trying to separate children you know, from their parents. Um, so you have that. You then also have um, the phenomenon where everything is collectively owned. And so, uh, you know, just to take a small example that polls would talk about is, uh, okay, if you're, um, if the broom or the mop in your apartment building is owned by the state, it's kind of like it's owned by you. And so it's okay for you to take it. So theft uh, was rampant. Um, so not just in, in apartment buildings, but in factories um, and uh, elsewhere. And so you have that problem. Uh, then you have the problem that the state simply the, the socialist economy simply couldn't supply the goods and services that people needed. Um, so if you wanted to get anything, um, you wanted to get chocolate for your kid to celebrate their birthday, or you wanted to obtain gasoline, or you wanted to obtain toilet paper, you probably had to be willing to break some rules, uh, turn to the black market. Now, in a society where so much of everyday life is made illegal, you know, the things that we take for granted, like buying toilet paper at an above market price, <laughs> like if that's illegal, you criminalize so much activity that normalizes criminality, right? And so if you're willing to break the normal rules in order to obtain chocolate or toilet paper, then it, it sort of softens your, um, your uh, you know, internal barriers to breaking more significant rules, right? Uh -huh. um, so... One of the things you then find is, uh, and, and you you see this in the writings of Poles uh, in the 1980s, is uh, really worker alienation and societal alienation. Just as Marx predicted of capitalism, you saw people becoming extraordinary, extraordinarily disillusioned with the system. You know, here is a system that robbed them of their dignity, their ability to buy, you know, uh, goods that you and I would take for granted. Um, and so, you know, there's one quote from a woman who had to uh, manipulate the system in order to obtain drapes. So it's, you know, it's a simple thing. It's drapes. Um, and she tells the journalists who ask her about it, she kind of tells it with a little bit of a smile. Uh, she, you know, she is manipulating the system that had manipulated her her entire life. Uh, and once that kind of becomes normalized, uh, that's a very uh, corrosive, you know, societal practice. Yeah, you can see it really tears down kind of these bonds of social trust and probably makes it difficult in the post transition back to capitalism, which is something I hope we talk about in the next part of our conversation. Um, so we are out of time for this part of our conversation. And so I'd like to thank our guest, Matthew Mitchell, for sharing his expertise with us. And if you are been interested in what Matt has been sharing with us during this conversation, come back for part two, where we learn more about Poland's transition out of socialism and what things might look like there today. Um, thank you so much, Matt. Thank you so much, Rosie. It's great chatting with you. Thanks for joining us for the Realities of Socialism podcast, where we take a deep dive into the consequences of socialism as it was imposed on tens of millions of people during the 20th century. For more information, including infographics, free books, and more podcast episodes, visit realitiesofsocialism.org.